So uh, thanks so much, Doug. Our next speaker um, is Roger Grimes. Uh, as many of you know, Roger he probably doesn't need my introduction here, but uh, Roger is extremely uh, passionate about cybersecurity. He's written over a dozen books on the topic. Um, he's a frequent speaker on TV and podcasts and radio and such, and was uh, one of our most popular uh, presenters from Authenticate 2021. So very pleased to welcome Roger back on our stage uh, to talk to you today. Thank you. Uh, last year, if you saw me speak, I talked a lot about um, uh, many different ways that MFA could be hacked. And I'm still going to talk about that this time, but I'm going to go a lot quicker. Really what I decided to come back with this year is the solutions. How do you make uh, MFA solutions that are more resilient and less likely to be hacked? Uh, but I will cover some of the ways. Forward, there we go. Uh, I'm going to give a couple examples of fishable MFA, and then really the, the main part of the uh, focus is how, again, you can pick better solutions and how you can make better solutions. So this is both for customers that are using MFA and, and vendors that are creating MFA. Uh, and I always tell people, people should use phishing-resistant MFA whenever they can to protect valuable data and systems. There's kind of two camps. There's the, hey, you should use any MFA. And then there's people like me, which is you should use phishing-resistant MFA. I'm definitely in the latter camp because the biggest reason why we're all going from passwords to MFA is to stop uh, password theft. And if your MFA solution secret, it's just as easy to steal as a password. It was a lot of effort and money and expense to, to go to the new whiz-bang thing. But I do love, I love MFA. I wrote a book on it. Uh, it was called Hacking MFA. I know probably 60, 70, 80 ways to hack MFA. Any MFA solution can be hacked. The most secure solution uh, can be hacked at least a handful of different ways. I've hacked in my career, 34-year career, uh, at least 160 different types of MFA solutions or security reviewed them. All of them can be hacked. Uh, I've had many, many vendors tell me that they couldn't be hacked. They easily got hacked. It's, and I'm not like, it's not like I'm an Uber hacker on a scale one to six. I mean, one to 10, I may be a six. It's just that once you know how to do it, it's like being an electrician or a plumber or something. Uh, but even though they can all be hacked, there are many, like FIDO, that are far more resilient than of the others. Uh, so I'd say that the average MFA solution that I see can be hacked probably 10 or 11 different ways, uh, and FIDO is significantly less than that. The most common way, like when I tell people, hey, your MFA solution shouldn't be fishable or should be phishing resistant, this is the, the, probably the most common attack I'm referring to called Network Session Hijacking. The first time I wrote about this attack was in 1989 for InfoWorld Magazine, where I was the weekly security columnist for uh, 20 years. But it, it goes like this, that the victim has sent a phishing email that pretends to be from some trusted brand that's trying to trick them into using their password, their MFA. If the user was to hover over the link and take a look at it, that link would not be going to the trusted brand where they thought they were going but instead is taking them to a man-in-the-middle transparent proxy website where the hacker can now intercept and eavesdrop on everything that the potential victim types in, and then everything, the real website that it then proxies them to, the website the victim thought they were going to in the first place, sends back to the victim. So now there's this server sitting in between, and again, anything the user types in, like an MFA code or something like that, uh, the hacker can get anything the victim's website sends back uh, such as you know, credit card information, some type of uh, challenge code or something like that, or really what hackers in this particular case are trying to get is called the access control token cookie. Every time you successfully log onto a website, whether it's with or without MFA, you're going to be sent back, your browser is going to be sent back a text-based cookie that has a uh, usually randomly generated session ID that kind of identifies you for this session as you move among the website. It essentially is like your driver's license. It says, this is you, Roger Grimes. You've successfully authenticated. And now you can access all the things that your identity is allowed to access. Uh, but the hacker will then disconnect the legitimate victim's uh, session, take the access control token cookie, log in as them, typically change the victim's password, and sometimes even implement MFA. Uh, that's one of the weirdities is that on many of the accounts where the victim didn't have MFA, if the attacker then implements MFA, I've never heard of that victim ever getting control of that account back. Uh, but this is, again, when I, when I say you should not use phishing or fishable MFA, this is the type of attack that I'm talking about. There's other more sophisticated attacks, but this is the main one. Uh, you don't even have to be an Uber hacker. 
it's built into most malware and or, or much of the malware we have today and also the phishing kits. Uh, last year I uh, demoed uh, this sort of that network session hijacking attack using uh, showing an attack tool called Evil Jinx that hackers could use to implement this sort of attack. It's now in phishing kits and this one's called Evil Proxy. Uh, but you know, you don't have to be anybody or know anything. You can just buy this phishing kit and kick off a phishing campaign that will intercept the MFA codes. Uh, and that's very popular this year. Uh, mobile malware, a large percentage of mobile malware is password stealing malware. It is also MFA stealing malware. Um, and MFA attacks have been around for decades. Again, I first wrote about it in 1989. Uh, but it certainly is going mainstream this year. Uh, Auth0 reported their, in their, one of their recent reports, uh, State of Insecurity or Security, uh, that there is a, they detected on their own platform alone 113 million attacks against multi-factor authentication. That's one vendor in 90 days. And that's probably against billions and billions of other sorts of attacks, but it's a, it's a pretty common thing today. Uh, another type of common attack, of course, is uh, attacks against SMS-based authentication codes, which the U.S. government and NIST Special Publication 800-63, the Digital Identity Guidelines, uh, which is coming out, going to have a new update soon. They said don't use any uh, MFA or authentication that relies upon a phone number like SMS does, and they specifically call out SMS. And the biggest reason why is you can't trust where that message is coming from. You can claim to be anybody. You can claim to be Elon Musk or Bill Gates or whoever, uh, and then text somebody. Uh, here's a really common type of attack where uh, if I knew that you uh, use, let's say, Fidelity Investments for your stock account or something, I go, oh, as a hacker, I go, oh, that has SMS reset. I can go tell them that I forgot my password or my MFA is not working, request a reset, and they'll send me an SMS code. Well, I can go ahead if I know a victim has like Fidelity Investment or something like that or Bank of America or Wells Fargo or mo most, most of the major players allow you to do uh, password recovery or MFA recovery through SMS, uh, I can send you a fake message claiming to be like from your water company. Go, hey, I'm from your water company. Uh, we've detected a large water main break in your area. Please do not drink the water from your tap until further notice. Boil your water. We're sorry for this inconvenience. Would you like to be warned when it's safe to drink your drinking water? You know, who wouldn't want to know when it's safe to drink their drinking water? As soon as they reply yes, you know you have them because they think it's the water company. Then you go reset their account. Uh, you tell them, hey, we're going to send you a confirmation code that I need you to reply to in order to confirm your request so we can subscribe you to this service. And uh, every, let me say, every time I've done this test, I have friends that tell me, you, I work for No before, we're trying to fight phishing. Uh, but I have friends that tell me, you can't fish me, you can't trick me. Every single time I've done this trick, it has worked against the most savviest IT people that I know. And it's because people just don't know. And when they get a code that they're expecting to get, they will easily retype it into another message. Uh, really, really common type of attack today. So what can you do to try to stop really common types of phishing attacks? That's what I want to cover this year round. Uh, first of all, at the bare minimum, your attack should stop the man in the middle proxy of sites, a, a, a transparent, rogue transparent website proxy attacks that I talked about. And let me say, thankfully, FIDO does. That's one of the things I love. As soon as you have a solution that has the word FIDO on it, if it's truly been FIDO enabled, uh, you can immediately throw out these very common man in the middle attacks. But it is not true for 90, 95% of MFA today. The MFA that most people use is easily fishable. Uh, and in some cases, it's going to be hard to repair that or change that solution. In other cases, that solution can be changed. Uh, but if you can make it FIDO enabled, it gets rid of those large amount of attacks. I also think that any MFA solution should contain enough features and information to help users defeat common types of attacks against that, M that type of MFA. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples during today's talk. Also, you shouldn't oversell the protection. Uh, lots of vendors and lots of leaders have been saying things like MFA stops 99% of attacks. It is not true. It has never been true. It will never be true. Uh, if it was true, when FBI and CISA uh, put out ransomware notices telling you how to protect yourself, it would be one bullet point. It'd be a really short notice. But if you notice, they're usually multiple pages with about 10 or 20 bullet points. MFA is good. MFA, non-fishable MFA, significantly reduces your chance of attack. It's probably the single thing that you can do that best increases your chances of not being hacked. 
but it is not 99 or 99.99% of the attacks. I've been saying this for years. A friend of mine even gave me a license plate, a, a fake vanity license plate, saying that it, it isn't 99%. Uh, but I think when you tell people that MFA stops 99% of attacks, and then they get attacked, you're causing trust issues between them. We already have a lot of trust issues because we've been telling people to do stuff for decades and it still hasn't worked. They're attacked more than ever. And if we're giving them one more panacea solution that's going to be the solution to all their hacking, uh, then it's going to create trust issues when they get hacked. And there's been a lot of, a lot of MFA hacks this year. Uh, and I even say, like, be careful when you tell people, hey, uh, my biometric solution, you know, it's impossible to hack. Uh, your fingerprint's unique in the world, which is probably true. We don't know that it's true, but it's probably true. Uh, but uh, the way that we store and use biometric attributes is not unique in the world, uh, right? It's not as nearly as unique as your entire fingerprint might be. And it's all right, I think, again, to say, if, I think if you, even when um, director of CISA yesterday, Jen Easterly, said using MFA defeats the largest percentage of attacks, I think that's a really good thing to share with customers and tell people. Just don't tell them that it's going to defeat everything. I mean, like 20% of attacks are, uh, un or use unpatched software. 25% of phishing attacks try to induce the user to download a Trojan horse program. And those are things that are not going to be defeated by multi-factor authentication. Also realize that humans do not always act rationally uh, or responsibly. That's, uh, I mean, I've, I've been trying to fight social engineering attacks for 34 years, but it really came to me, came home. Uh, when I started to talk about push-based MFA, where you get the little push code that says, is this you logging on from you know, Tampa, Florida, yes or no? Uh, when I first heard about this solution yeah. just probably a handful of years ago, I liked it so much that in my book, Hacking Multi-Factor Authentication, I said, this is one of the great solutions. I love it. It's not tied to your phone number in most of the cases. A lot of times it has an app with it. It tells you your location, might tell you what browser and OS you're using. What a fantastic tool. But well, as before, we found out about somewhere around 30% of users can be tricked into approving a prompt that they themselves did not initiate. Uh, I remember even talking to one CISO and was asking him, uh, he was the person that let in 88 prompts that said that they originated from within Russia and Ukraine, and uh, let in 88 prompts over a series of months uh, that allowed $10 million to eventually be stolen. But I said, uh, I didn't say, another person said, why did you approve 88 prompts uh, that were coming from Russia? And the person said, hey, I was just told that if I got this prompt just to say yes, right? And I was like, well, I was thinking in my head, maybe that's true because I can imagine IT is just trying to get this thing out there, right? And they're trying to, they're telling people they can't use passwords and you have to use this push-based MFA. And hey, you get this push-based prompt, you just say yes, probably not thinking that they would tell them, if it's not you, don't say yes. Uh, but it turns out there's a lot of people that don't understand that, and there's many different ways to do it. Today, I would consider push-based MFA um, one of the more hackable, fishable type solutions. Although it really, you can really significantly strengthen it just by telling your employees, hey, you might be given a prompt when you're not logging in, and if you do, don't say yes. Say deny and, 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 and report this to IT security. Literally, the solution for a really fishable problem is simply focused in user education on the problem. And then that great solution becomes great again. Um, I do like the kind of the number match ones that come up today where you have to know the magic number. Uh, I know that Google, Microsoft, and Duo at the very least are doing this. And at first I was like, this is really a great idea because the user gets a number on the login screen that they have to either type in or, or match uh, on the push-based MFA. Then I thought, a lot of these social engineers are just going to go, hey, I'm logging in, and the number that I'm seeing on my screen is 22, and if you don't you know, select that option, I'm going to be bugging you all night until I get this patch installed. So I'm betting that can be socially engineered around, but it's a good thing. I like it. It doesn't stop man-in-the-middle proxy attacks, but now we'll get into the stuff that's uh, important. Uh, certainly every uh, vendor here should require that all, or make sure that all their developers are trained in secure programming, a secure development lifecycle, SDL. I worked at Microsoft for 11 years. We're very big believers in SDL, and Microsoft probably, if you go to microsoft.com forward slash SDL, they probably have more information and documents and tools and guides than anybody else out there. Carnegie Mellon has a lot of stuff. Uh, but it's amazing today that 30, you know, 30, almost 35 years into the cybersecurity career, that almost no developer, no college, no university teaches has a course on how to develop securely. 
Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a really big problem today. And so we should, and all vendors should make sure that your people at least read a secure, you know, SDL, secure code development book or, or materials, that they use tools that are secure by default, uh, and that they do good best practices. That include also that everybody should make sure that they have in-house code review and also in-house penetration testing of some sort. You should also always hire an external pen penetration testing team because I can tell you from experience, the external team will always find stuff that the internal team didn't find and vice versa. Uh, you should change your external pen testing, penetration testing team uh, every couple of years because when you hire somebody year after year, they kind of get to know you, they get the inside information, and they kind of do the same things. Uh, vendors should participate in bug bounties. Uh, I have people email me all the time that tell me they found a bug in a certain type of MFA program and they want to know about how they can go about getting paid. Uh, they're like, can I just tell them I found this bug and I want to get paid? And that's really weird. That's kind of like extortion. Uh, but they just want to get paid for it. And if you give them a bug bounty program, you can do it in a way that usually leads to responsible disclosure. Although I am sometimes surprised by how many vendors go, hey, that isn't a bug. It is as designed. And then three months later, after a lot of media scrutiny, they fixed that as designed feature. Uh, it'd be just nice if the vendors, if they could confirm that indeed was a bug that some people are perceiving as an MFA bug, just agreed to pay for it and get it fixed. That happens a lot. Here's another big one. And this is something almost no vendor does. I think all vendors should publicly uh, threat model, or they should threat model their solutions and then share that threat modeling outcome with their customers. Lots of vendors do threat modeling internally, but they don't share that information. And I talk to MFA users all the time, and they are shocked by how easy some of these solutions can be made in the middle or how they can be hacked, and they weren't told about this by the vendor. Because the vendor wants to appear as, you use my solution, it's unhackable, uh, you know, it's, uh, mine is the one that you want to get, it's so great. But I think FIDO, I will say that I love this, I think FIDO is the only one that I know that does this, they share, they publicly share their threat model. And I don't think any of us here don't like FIDO. I love FIDO. I think it strengthens the FIDO solution because they are sharing the ways that they put down many of the attacks. And they even share, like, here's some of the attacks that are still possible against FIDO, and here's some of the things you can do to offset it, like channel binding, even if you don't use that solution or can't use that solution. I really do think that this is a big part of how you solve the problem we have today of MFA being hacked to death by sharing with customers that, hey, this is how we solve, this is the problem we solve, this is what we protect you against, but here's some of the things that we can't protect you against, and here's some of the common types of attacks against our type of MFA solution and how you can prevent them. I really think this is a big way that could restore confidence in our industry. Um, if you haven't threat modeled your own solution before, know that there's lots of different dependencies that go into your solution. Uh, when I hack solutions, many times I'm not really even actually hacking the solution itself, but I'm hacking some dependency like the namespace or the IP address or a poorly implemented crypto uh, protocol or something like that. But you have all these different components that are involved that you need to threat model for your solution. There's lots of different actions going between different sites uh, and different components, and you have to assume that different things that are handed off between one and the other aren't necessarily always valid. Um, and then you figure out what are, what are all the different ways that I could attack each of those components and actions. Uh, I, I have a list of about 12 or 13 uh, overall uh, attack methods that can be used against it to hack any solution, but here are the ones that I find that are really, really common. When I say I can hack uh, MFA, the average MFA solution, 10, 11 ways. These are the ways right here that often work against those particular types of solutions. Uh, but again, I think you should threat model your solution uh, and share it with your customers. And if you're a customer, I think you should ask the, uh, your vendor, have they done a threat modeling solution and can I see it? And what do you recommend that I do to make sure that we aren't hacked when we use your solution? Uh, weak SMS codes. Uh, I see <laughs> these are recent SMS codes that I've been sent. Uh, again, you shouldn't use SMS. And some people ask me, well, is SMS better than passwords? No, no, I don't think so. At least with, at least with passwords, I have some control over my life about whether I get fished out of it or not. But with SMS, not so much. Uh, but you can see there's not a lot of information in, in a lot of these codes that are sent to people. Uh, so when you get a code, if someone's told you to expect a code, it's really easy to fish them into providing that other services code 
to the phishing attack, really what you should do whenever possible in your MFA solution is provide the who, what, where, why, and then how to report abuse. Kind of like in that push-based MFA solution, you want to educate people, by the way, if you didn't initiate this login, you should report it to IT security. Just simple words. This is how I envision being a computer geek of how an MFA or how an SMS code or really any type of MFA solution should be. It should have lots of, inf oops, lots of information in it. Uh, tell them exactly what's occurring, what website it's on so they're not being tricked by a man in the middle uh, site. Uh, why it's being, like other times they're like, here's the code. Well, what's the code for? Am I subscribing to something or am I resetting my password on another website? If you don't get the information, you don't know. And then warn them uh, that you know if this is something you didn't do, you need to report it. Uh, here's better real-life examples I've gotten from FedExpress and Truist recently. It's not quite the information that you're looking that I would really like to see, but I can see you know it's a usability friction issue. And so uh, if you can't give everything, at least give them enough give them enough information to make a valid decision and give them a, a way to report it if it isn't uh, them involved in that request. Also, you should make sure that your settings uh, should be the most secure options by default. Some of the MFA hacks that have happened over the last couple of years have been because they had, uh, by default, they had fell open, saying when something didn't work, just make it fell open as if it's not there. And I certainly understand that. That's a user friction issue. But I think the default setting should be fail close. The customer should have to go out of their way to make it fail open. So if the customer wants a fail open, they can get it. But it's not the default because most customers want to go next, 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 next and take the defaults. Uh, they should be the most secure options. You should disable older protocols. Uh, certainly lots of vendors have learned that the last couple of years. And it's even kind of strange, like a, another type of attack um, that I've seen a bit recently that I didn't cover in my book. Uh, was that you have the SAML tokens or whatever, uh, and you will have one type of authentication if you're logging in from your laptop and another from your phone. Uh, like with Gmail, if I go to log in on my company laptop and I want Gmail, I have to go through my FIDO token to get there. But if I want it on my phone, I just hit an icon and it goes right to my email. And there's no FIDO interaction at all. Uh, and then a lot of times you can take those solutions. If I'm an attacker, take that solution, just modify the origination device that it's coming from, and all of a sudden I get weaker security. Uh, so I've seen that attack a lot lately. That's been used to compromise lots of people over the last year or two. Um, stolen shared secrets should not lead immediately to an immediate compromise. So that's like with passwords where we put them in hashes. We hash passwords. So if they get stolen, they're not, that doesn't immediately get your password. Should try to uh, securely protect secrets. Uh, you can transform original shared secrets to new shared secrets. There's even a protocol for that, dynamic symmetric key provisioning protocol, RFC that's been around for years you can use. Or today we talk about transforming secrets to something else called tokenism, uh, maybe uh, one name, or I say like, it, you know, it's kind of the same as like if you take a fingerprint, you convert it to the little star constellation, well then hash that star constellation uh, so that uh, if somebody was to steal the stored secrets of your fingerprints, they're not getting to somebody's fingerprints. I've had like uh, 5.6 other million people in America, I had all 10 of my fingerprints stolen years ago on an OPM attack. Uh, what system that re would remotely rely upon in my fingerprint ever be able to know that it really is me? They can't because my fingerprints have been stolen. That still happens all the time. Uh, and in the future, you might be able to use uh, homography or homographic encryption. That's a way to store secrets uh, in its encrypted state and still use them. Uh, don't make up custom cryptography. I see a lot of uh, MFA solutions. Like, we got this new super duper uh, you know, crypto. Uh, we made up our own algorithms and protocols. Never good. Never, ever good. Uh, but probably even more important is make sure that your solution is crypto agile. I also wrote a book on quantum computer attacks. <laughs> And sometime soon, we will have sufficiently capable quantum computers uh, that are capable of breaking today's traditional encryption. And we have no idea when that's going to happen. Is it going to be 10 years from, uh, from now, or has it already happened? And the government's just not telling us. We don't know. But what we do know for sure is whatever your solution is, you're going to have to update your solution to have different encryption. Even the encryption protocols they tell you to use one day will be broken, uh, and you're going to have to update them. So if you're a vendor, Make sure that your solution is crypto agile so the customer doesn't have to do this massive upgrade or replace just to get a simple encryption change. 
and customers should start asking their vendors to make say, is this product crypto agile? And when they say, I don't know what you're talking about, you educate them and tell them that's a part of your purchasing decision now. Uh, also, account lot, you should always have rate limiting or throttle, throttling for bad guesses. I'm amazed by the number of MFA projects that will allow hundreds of guesses or thousands of guesses without locking out. If we lock out passwords after three, four, or six guesses, shouldn't we do the same with MFA? You right, have some type of reasonable account lockout. Uh, all uh, authentication secrets should expire in a reasonable period of time. That makes sense. There's a lot of authentication secrets like travel codes and vacation codes that just never expire or the Google uh, QR codes and things like that have no expiration date on them. All secrets or things that lead to secrets should have expiration codes so they can't be used in perpetuity. Uh, they should prevent tampering, running out of time here. This is what I'll finish with. No matter what MFA that you're using, whether it's fishable or non-fishable, we all have to use combinations of both. Make sure you educate yourself and everybody around you about the common types of attacks that, are, that occur against that MFA solution and then how to uh, detect them, prevent them, and report them. That's it. I'm done. If you have any questions, let me know. I'll take it at the back of the room. Thanks for putting up with me once again. Enjoy your conference.